up, Steve? My name is uh, Robert Alexander with the Heavy Bag. I'm just going to start off with a couple. Oh, I'm doing great, man. I'm going to start off with a couple of questions we have here for you. Alright. Um, my first question I have here for you is uh, on your last fight, <clears throat> your last fight you, it, uh, resulted in a loss due to a botched decision. And then lately, there have been some immense scrutiny in recent fights here about bad judging. Uh, what do you think uh, needs to change in judging to uh, help help with that? Uh, I mean, I don't know. Uh, it, 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 it goes like this. It depends on what was the situation with the judges. I mean, I can only speak for the fight that I've had that was scored ridiculous. And I, and I know I box. I box and I punch, you know, so... I, obviously, in that Adamic fight, these judges just weren't counting my jabs. You know, my jabs were obvious. They were they were snapping his head back. You know, they were doing damage. You know, I just don't, you know, and then they just wasn't counting, you know, my ring generalship. I basically controlled the ring. You know, I controlled the tempo. Adamic, only thing Adamic could do was come forward. And, I mean, that's all he does. He doesn't do anything else, so... The question needs to be asked, what are judges supposed to judge on? You know, I mean, they say ring generation. You know, I had that. They say effective, effective aggressiveness, not just aggressiveness. You know, um, I had that also just to tell my kids. You can see, you know, I stepped up the game and I went to him times. You know, I fought when I wanted to fight. Uh, ring generation, effective aggressiveness, punches scored. When he punches land, you know, and that's I felt I had all of that. So it's like, like I said, these judges need to be questioned. The, the whole judging system needs to be questioned. Needs to be explained to the fighters and me <laughs> and the public. Why? How do you judge fight? That, that's basically it. Right. I feel you on that one. Or you know, they might need some new. You know, they might need to look at some new criteria for it too. So yeah, I oh, guess yeah, no doubt. Like, Truthfully, what I think needs to happen is I think more fighters, more ex-fighters, more former fighters need to get involved in this sport that that have, that they've been involved with. Most of us have been involved in this since we were kids. So we need to really, that's the only way boxing is going to um, get taken care of. Uh, if you keep just getting these casual guys who, and, and there's nothing wrong with a guy who loves the sport, who loves to watch it and, but didn't participate. And, and, and just trying to be part of it in that one. But I just think it, it helps the boxing more if you have one of those guys or even two of those guys and you have a former fighter amongst those three judges and a referee, you know, stuff like that. You know, I just, I mean, fighters should give back to the sport that they that they love, made money in, you know, won championships in or something. You know that I mean. Without that, I think boxing is going to continue to get these black eyes, and um, there may be a few black eyes then, but I don't think it'll be like this. Nothing like this. Steve Cunningham doesn't lose that fight if, if boxers were, were judging that fight. <laughs> Not at all. Uh, definitely, I agree with that. Uh, so my next question then is: After your loss there, uh, you did get uh, very emotional after the fight. And then based on your comments, I can tell you did put it all out there in the ring. Uh, so with, with the decision and everything that happened to you and moving forward, do you have a little bit more faith in boxing now, or did it really discourage you in your approach? <clears throat> well, um, truthfully, my, my faith overall is in God. I mean, I know I know this is rough and just something that's crooked and corrupt that's seen that happened, but... I believe, you know, my guy allows this thing to happen in order to build me, build better character, put me in this position that he wants me in. You know, it's, all, it's not always about winning, you know, um, but it is about winning, but it's not, you know, for, you know, for what I believe in my God, his plan, his plan isn't always for me to win every time. If that was the case, you know, I'd be 28 no or something like that, you know, but um, I just, no, and I wasn't bitter. You know, I was, I'm not bitter at boxing. It's just the situation, you know. It's like, it's just one of those things, man. I mean, like I said on, on Facebook, even these judges were on the tape or they just don't know how to judge. They don't know their job, you know. It's just it's just ridiculous. And, um, and truthfully, if you look at the fight, they first called it a draw and then, and then right. they said it was a uh, split decision. And then... Well, then they said, hold up, they 
calling him. And the, the civil, I mean, the Pennsylvania Boxing Commissioner, Greg Sir, was in the ring. I don't know where he got numbers from. I don't remember seeing anybody tell him, hey, scratch out that 115. Because I think one of the judges had it, like, technically wrong. 115, 115, you can't have a draw at 115, 115. Like, that's impossible. Right. With no knock right. in the fight. That's impossible. So, I didn't, um, that's fishy right there. That's mad fishy right there. But, um, then you got the, the, the Pennsylvania Boxing Commissioner himself was scratching out and writing down numbers. And he's not a judge, you know. He's a commissioner. He's not a judge. What was he doing that for? And this is on national TV. I didn't really see this until I saw it on television. You know, good thing the cameraman was up on it. You know, he was right in his face with it. And it's just like, where did he get his numbers? To, what was he, you know, where was he getting these numbers to, to put in? You know, like, what is up? But then you have split decision win out of it. And I'm like, wow, that is ridiculous. Like, I mean, yeah, I was so shocked. It was, it was just super shocking. But... It didn't discourage me. It actually motivates me. It motivates me. I can't wait to get back in there to show the world, you know, I am a true heavyweight still. That fight showed the world I'm a heavyweight. It should have. You know, Tom Epidemic is the number, of, I think, three or four heavyweight in the world. You know, and then I gave him the boxing lesson. I schooled him, you know, and I just didn't get the decision. I got the win, but I didn't get the victory. You know what I mean? Or, or I got the victory, but I didn't get the win because all the fans, Everyone, everyone telling me, you know, they believe, they knew I won that fight, so I'm cool. Oh, so you did, definitely. And uh, so my, my uh, last question here actually is going back on your, a little bit on your old division, on the cruiserweight division. Uh, yeah. That division has, has most often been sort of, sort of a rest stop, you know, for future heavyweights and uh, like Evander Holyfield and, and everybody like that. But right now, there isn't a whole lot of uh, excitement in that division. Do you think it's due to maybe a lack of talent, or is it just that they're not getting the exposure that they need? It's the exposure. I mean, you know, when I was a cruiserweight, there were, you know, we were putting on fights. And the thing about the cruiserweight division is, in order for you to even make decent money, even some of those, even if you're, an, especially if you're an American with a belt, you know, you got to fight, you got to fight tough guys, you know, you got to fight the champions, the former champions, you know, um, there is no, I mean, I fought my mandatory because the champions didn't want to fight me, I had already beat the three champions that were holding the other belt, so I had to fight my mandatory, but, um, you know, you got guys like Marco Huck, he's just beating guys, you know, that he should be just sparring for fight, you know, but then when he fights opposition like Lebedev, or um or Ola Ofalabi, you know, or Farat Arslan, these are world class guys and they give him mad problems. Some think some think he lost those fights, but um the cruiserweight division, the guys when they fight, they're fighting it's the best fighting the best because everybody's jocking to be the best. You know, so I just don't understand why in America the cruiserweight's got no love at all. It's just it's it's just mind boggling. Okay, uh, thank you very much for uh, answering my questions here. That's what I had for you. Uh, I'm going to turn it over to Lucas now here. Go ahead, Lucas. Uh, thank you. Uh, yeah, we had some technical problems, but I got um, Rudy back on here. Um, so, Rudy, whenever you're ready. Hey, hey, what's up, guys? What's up, Steve? Hey, what's going on? Hey, um, that's much, man. Well, I got some questions for you. Um, my first question is, Having uh, served in the armed forces, how has that experience served uh, you after each of your, your defeats? How has it served to, say that again, to help me in my defeat? Yeah, like, how did, you know, being in the armed forces, I'm pretty sure you, 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 you got, you know, some unique experiences as far as, you know, dealing with, with you know, trials and tribulations in, in your life. How did that experience, being in the armed forces, how did that help you? record and in actuality it should only be one but 
you know, um, and even, but I mean, they're on my record and they look like losses, so um, really what helps me is overall is, is my belief in God, my, you know, me reading the Bible and trying to live it and, and knowing what God says, but through, through the military, the work ethic that, you know, you get from them, you know, from, from being so young and doing so much, working with this, you know, this billion dollar equipment, you know, handling things that you see, you know, doing things that you see on television, uh, being part of, of, of big stuff like being part of a war, you know, um, and I was an aircraft refueler on an aircraft carrier, and, you know, I, I refueled fighter jets and all this and that, so dealing with stuff like that, um, it's, it's, it's motivation, man, I mean, just, just knowing that I've done that, I can do this, like, you know, when I first got my, when I got my first loss, I fought for a world title, that's when I got my first loss, and that was a bad cheat, a bad robbery, and, you know, instead of being angry, angry at the system, or angry at, you know, boxing as a whole, I was just angry, you know, motivated, angry, angry, I, oh man, I want to get better, you know, I don't want them to be able to say that this guy beat me, no matter what, they won't be able to cheat me, you know, motivate, and that comes, that comes from, like, some of the military background of, of waking up early, doing things that you wouldn't think you could do, you know, before that, you know, before you got there, you know, you know the stuff that they have you doing is just, is a lot for, you know, the average person that doesn't even know what, what goes on. Right, right. Trainers are an important asset in a, in a fighter. Can you explain yeah. to us? Can you explain to us how is working with Nassim Richardson um, an asset to you, and, and how important is he in your career? Oh man, um, you know, <clears throat> before I, before I got with Nassim as a trainer, you know, um, you know, I was working, I was going hard, man. You know, I would go to the gym. I didn't live in the same city as my trainer. You know, um, so every day in between fights, I still was coming to the gym. You know, I was loyal. I wanted to be the best. I wanted to get to, to be the best. And, and, and in order to do that, man, I had to train. So I was coming to the gym regardless. And um, I, I worked hard. You know, I wore weight vests, you know, weighted shorts, weights on my gloves. I just, anything to push me. I knew that was going to build muscle and build strength. And uh, then when I got with Nazem, you know, he showed me things about my body that, you know, that I could do that I didn't even think I could do. You know, it's just like, wow, you know, I, I can spar three guys in a row with one arm. You know, I can just jab guys, <laughs> you know, for, for eight rounds, three different guys. These guys see what I'm doing, and they still can't do anything about it. There's a mindset that Nazem brings to the table for me. You know, like, I mean, you, I know you have your high-profile trainers out there, your Freddie Roaches you know, your Virgil Hunters and, and everybody, but, you know, um, I know Virgil Hunter's a great trainer to Andre Ward, but he may not be to Steve Cunningham, you know, just as Pacquiao, I mean, just as uh, Roach. He's a great trainer for Roach, I mean, for Pacquiao, but he may not be for Steve Cunningham, you know, but I know Nazim is a, is a, is a, is a perfect trainer for me because he makes me do things, man, and, and he makes me see things. That I never saw before, and and they work. So, so there, there's definitely, uh, you would say, there's definitely a, a chemistry between you two. Oh yeah, no doubt. Um, it's, it's, um, it, we're we're like a family, you know. I love Nazem. I love his, I love his wife. I love his kids. You know, and it's vice versa. We're we're like a family. We do things in between fights. It's not just boxing. You know, it's all kind of stuff, man. You know, we're uh, we're together here. You know, he's helping me train my son here and there. Um, as an amateur, uh, it's just uh, it's a family thing, you know. Um, it's a family, man. It's it's it's, it's love, it's respect, it's admiration, it's, it's um, it's just it's, it's a family. <laughs> yeah. Right, cool, cool, love it. Uh, my third question is um, going back on on the uh, Adam Adam X fight. Um, how bad yeah. he, how do you want a rematch with him, or or is that chapter with him? Over. Yeah, I, I'd say, I mean, I'd say if, if HBO Showtime said we got X amount of dollars to do the rematch and, and Adam says he'll do it, I'll do it, no doubt, you know, I will do it, 
I would get in the ring, and truthfully, I believe it would be like a Manny Pacquiao Marquez thing, you know. Um, I'll, I'll, it's going to be even worse. You know, a, a guy like Tomas is one dimensional. Um, you know, his trainer Bloodworth and him, you know, they were they were kind of faking the funk with people, saying he's a he's a more better boxer. He's got hand speed. Yeah, that's against 250 pound Chris Ariola. You know, that's against 240 pound Michael Grant or whatever. I don't think he was. You know, yeah, he's faster than those guys. But Thomas Adam and he, he his movement. I mean, the dude is one dimensional. So, um. I 
haven't done anything with them yet. Um, I haven't got down to the uh, to meet with it yet. I haven't. I think I went to like one event, but I, I really don't. I really don't know too much. Okay, okay, okay. Well, that, that concludes my questions, and uh, thanks for your time. And uh, I'll go. Um, Lucas is asking some other questions right now. Thank you, Steve. All right, cool. All right, Steve. Yeah, as I heard you say earlier, I mean, you did get screwed definitely by the judges there, but um, luckily for us, we don't have to even recognize that. Um, as far as our rankings go, I mean, you're number two. Only uh, people above you right now are the Klitschko's because the Damon has actually beat quite a few people there at heavyweight. Yeah. But, uh, right. yeah, I mean, so really, I mean, the only two people above you being Klitschko's, is that a fight you're interested in now? Or is it yeah. you want to get a couple more in at heavyweight first? Or? Well, I mean, the thing is, I don't, um, my whole thing is I don't want to go at a Klitschko, you know, half cock. Those dudes are the cream of the crop, and you want to be right. Um, I would like a, I would not take a fight against a Vladimir Vitaly if they offered it to me right now for a couple of reasons. I know the money would be short, you know. Um, from what I know, the guys who they pick to fight versus a mandatory don't make a lot of money. So if you're going to fight one of those monsters, you need to be getting paid. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So, um, so for that simple, one of that simple fact is, you know, I'd rather go a Vivekan route right now. And, uh, you know, I would, I would challenge Vivekan for his title. Winning that fight would put me, you know, as a, as a heavyweight title is, and then I would negotiate a fight with Vladimir or whoever whoever else is up there. You know, and it's totally worth it, you know. But, uh, I mean, that's the, the direction we're looking at right now is for Vekin, you know. So um, that's, the, that, that's where I want to go. I, I mean, I think that's a good fight. I think it's a good fight for boxing. I think it's a good fight for me. Um, I'm not underestimating him at all. He is a good, solid fighter. But um, I think we, we can snatch that belt off his waist. Yeah. I mean, he, he is a big solid fighter, especially, I mean, Vladimir. Um, I mean, he has a, a chin at some times, but uh, his reign as champion has been, like, really long. What does it take to beat him? Vladimir, I mean, i tell you the truth. You know, the one thing it's going to take to beat Vladimir is for the guy who's fighting him to be in shape, you know, to be in shape and have a game plan and stick to that game plan. You see these guys that they've been fighting. I mean, that Vladimir has been fighting. And even Vitaly. They go in here and they try to knock the brothers out. And, you know, only because Vladimir, they feel they feel Vladimir's got a weak chin because he went down before. But when's the last time Vladimir hit the canvas? And against who? You know, was it Sam Peter? Right. You no, know, it's like, come on, Sam Peter was a powerhouse. You know, he was a powerhouse. Uh, most people get hit by that dude they're going down. But you got guys like, you know, Shannon Briggs, he go in there, and Shannon Briggs can box his butt off, but he goes in there and he tries to slug, he tries to punch, he tries to knock the guy out. Uh, you got all these other guys who fought Vital, I mean, Vladimir, try the same thing, try to knock him out, knock him out. And it's, you need to box these guys, be able to go 12 rounds and put punishment on them, touch them and don't get touched. That's what's going to beat these dudes. You know, that's, what, that's what's going to happen. And, and then while you're boxing, you may you may crack them, you know, so you never know, but you got to give yourself a chance by being in shape. Yeah, I definitely agree with you there. You know, you're, um, we also enjoy you, I mean, as an analyst, you seem like you have a career in that. Is that something you'd be interested in after you're done with boxing? Oh, man, no doubt. I mean, that's like, that's like money in the bank, man. You know, uh, getting paid to do what you all, you know, what you know, you know? Yeah, well, I mean, I, yeah, definitely. Well, we definitely appreciate you coming on here. Uh, you know, look forward to seeing you as an analyst, but even more, you know, seeing you as a, as a heavyweight now. But we definitely appreciate you coming on, and uh, appreciate it, man. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Yeah, we'll, we'll be seeing you later. Okay. All right, man. Thank you.